This session is being recorded. We want this so that it is available to the public for future reference and anybody who's implementing RDM in the future and wants to just be able to refer to this recording uh, may answer some of the questions that they have. So just please be aware of that. This is being recorded and will be available to the public. All right. So let me go ahead and introduce today's panelists. Um, Scott Blair, want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Scott Blair with BER. All right. And how long have you been involved in the RDM standards? Uh, since the very beginning. Um, we started uh, working on preliminary work back in 99. Uh, um, and then uh, we started the standardization effort in 2001 and first published in 2006. All right. Milton, tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm Milton Davis. I uh, work for Doug Planner Design. And I'm also an EGCT recognized uh, electrician and recognized trainer. Uh, gosh, I've been working on uh, various standards committees since, uh, oh, 1997, I'll say, something like that, uh, starting off with the UNX 512A and that sort of things up through current day. All right. And I'm Eric Johnson. I'm a volunteer for the Standards program, I've been working with these standards for over 10 years. So hopefully we'll be able to have some good technical discussion here and be able to answer any questions that do come up. We also have a number of people in the room, so we expect we'll certainly have um, questions coming in both remotely and from folks in the room. All right, so let's start with a little bit of background. What is RDM? Scott, you wanna take this? Sure, RDM stands for Remote Device Management. Um, it's an industry standard that uh, is defined in ANSI E1.20. Uh, all, all of the ESTA standards are actually published through ANSI, so that's why you'll see the ANSI uh, in front of instead of ESTA. Um, RDM is frequently in conjunction with DMX, uh, E1, DMX 512, which is ANSI E1.11. It's actually an extension of uh, DMX in that we ride over the same pair of wires as uh, DMX signal and uh, we use the same packet format essentially um, with an alternate start code for an alternate start code. Um, RDM is for management while DMX is for control um, where you normally use it for actually controlling your lighting rig. Uh, RDM is really for management and monitoring. So it basically allows you to do all the things that you would uh, normally do from the uh, front panel of a moving light fixture from the demo rack without actually having to get out a ladder and go to them. And that's a key point because, you know, the question is what can I do with RDM? RDM is management. It's not controlling your fixtures. You're typically not using it for queues. You're typically not using it to run your, you know, to run queues and to make things happen during the show. You're using RDM to manage the fixture all of the setup, monitoring, error logging, and protection things that you would do. RDM and DMX run on the same wire. They do many of the same things. They talk to many of the same things. But as far as at the protocol level, there's only a handful of connections between the two. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. A little bit of terminology, Milton? You want to? Sure, I'd be glad to get into that. Uh, also, just uh, going backwards for just a second, if anyone is ECCP certified, this session is worth half an hour towards renewal credit of your certification. So a little on RDM technology. RDM is based ar about around sending commands, which we refer to as PIDs, or parameter IDs. And an RDM command can have typically two different formats, either a GET or a SET. A GET being getting information from some device, and a SET being telling the device to do something specific. Uh, alter its configuration, for example. So typically those uh, gets or set commands are sent from a controller. And a controller, it sends requests and it receives responses back from something called responders, a console or a tester that can manage RDM responders. So typically a console is what we would think of as a controller and a responder receives commands and sends responses typically a fixture or some kind of other equipment that can be managed by RDM. So in the nature of RDM, in an RDM network, there's a single controller and a number of responders. And we'll get into that more in a little bit later. All right, thank you, Milton. 
So one of the things you're going to hear us talking a lot about today is the DMX slot footprint. The slot footprint in DMX defines how many slots of DMX data are used. And it can be any, for an RDM responder, it can be anywhere from zero to 512 slots because there's only 512 slots on the universe. Any fixture that uses DMX has a slot footprint of greater than zero. And the slot footprint for that fixture can be retrieved via RDM, specifically via the get device info. And there is another way that we'll, we'll talk about later. This is important because if you're doing features like auto patch or even patching, your console needs to know not only where to patch the fixture in, in the DMX address space, but it also needs to know how much, how many slots within DMX, how many slots of DMX it takes to allow it to do the patch or tell you if you have too much equipment to patch into a universe. A side note, those of us on the technical side can get a little pedantic about language. Please don't call them channels. Slot is the correct technical term. And that has been defined since the 2004 edition of DMX. So you've had 13 years to get used to the terminology change. So please do refer to them as slot. And there's actually a reason for that. Channel is a very nebulous concept. <clears throat> you know, I have a 30, you know, I have a 300 channel control console. Well, to some consoles, that means you can control 300 dimmers. To some, one channel can be a media server with 400 parameters. So a slot means a very specific thing. It is one byte within a null start code within a DMX packet. And so the slot footprint is how many bytes out of that DMX 512 null start code that it uses. We all slip up and use channel, but in this context, it is the correct technical term. Think of it like when somebody refers to a lamp as a bulb. You just kind of cringe a little bit, and that's how, that's how we are. So in addition to a slot footprint, fixtures will often have multiple personalities. People have said that about me. Also, your fixtures will frequently have multiple personalities. We've all done this from the front panel of a moving light. Coarse mode, fine mode, limited feature modes, advanced mode, super advanced mode. You know, if you're trying to pack more onto a universe, you go to a smaller footprint. If, you, you know, if you're trying to get more features or want more granular control, you go to a personality with a larger footprint. And also within RDM, every personality can have a different slot footprint. So the controller can ask, get personality description. And that tells you a couple of things. It gives you a human readable name for the personality. Course mode, fine mode, RGB, RGBAW, RGBAWB, QXGYM, 3B you know, and the slot footprint. So you can see that if I go into course mode, it's going to take an additional 13 slots or how that is going to use it. Every responder has at least one personality. And it can have up to 255 personalities. We're telling you about this because personalities and how we work with the slot characterization kids are very closely linked. As a side note, if you're using more than about a dozen personalities for your fixture, you probably ought to think how, rethink how you model your fixture for the console. It's really tempting to use personality as a catch-all, but beyond a certain amount, it gets very cumbersome for the user. So, you know, if you find that you're needing 50, 60, 100, 200 personalities, maybe rethink your fixture model. Maybe there are some other PIDs that you can use. Maybe you ought to look at the PID expansion documents. But these really are just meant to be a sort of discrete list of, you know, a handful of personalities, how you want this thing to respond. So, DMX slot characterization in our view. Milton, you want to take this one? I can take the beginning of this, absolutely. Okay, so slot characterization. I'm going to take this a little bit backwards. There are different ways that we want to describe the different uses of the slots. And we, there are three different commands of his that we might use for that. One is the slot description, one is the default slot value, and we'll have the slot info. Uh, so responder 
provides those basic, often provides those basic uh, PIDs. Should be noted that these three PIDs are not required by any RDM device. It is optional to, uh, to include plot description, plot value, and plot info. But it's a good idea to have them there. And if they are present, then that responder, we'll call it a fixture in this case, uh, can provide basic information about the slot, slots that it uses. And as Eric said earlier, those slots can change their description and their usage depending on what personality is active at the time. And it does give you some good information, but it is not a replacement for a console library or a fixture library. Uh, so as a result, simple fixtures can be described pretty fully. Media server with hundreds of parameters and using lots of slots of data. You'll never get that accurately described using the tools available to you in RDM at the moment. Um, I'd like to take a little bit of an aside about that. Yeah. We often get questions, why do I still need fixture libraries? Why can't RDM completely describe my fixture? And at one sense, this seems like it should be a very simple question. You know, you just describe what it does. But how a console or a controller model its data model is so intrinsically linked to what it wants in its library that even interchanging information between two different controllers that were developed really by the same people is very difficult. Whether you're dealing with real world values, how do you reflect color? What color spaces are you working with internally? How do you represent multi-parameter fixtures? How do you represent strip lights? It's a surprisingly complex problem. And nobody has found a perfect solution to that. We wish it were more, we wish it were simple. We really wish we could give that full plug and play experience. But it, you know, it's been tried several times. And even with smart people in lots of years, there just isn't a universal, you know, be it DDL or any of the other commercial attempts that have tried, even translating from one vendor to another is incredibly difficult. For simple stuff, it's generally pretty doable. And simple stuff really composes the majority of what we work with every day. And it's a lot of things that we see turning up unexpectedly, the unbranded equipment or the equipment that we're not familiar with. All right, so I think I'm gonna take a pause and look around the room here, as well as people want to want to submit questions through the WebEx interface. Any questions or concerns about what we've discussed so far that people would like us to address? Yeah, Peter. Not so much concern, but certainly uh, with respect to the slot description. I use a pre structure about the site, but the way text description is simple text. And Certainly, an application that's put to good use of that text is where you have a dynamic control interface, maybe if you're doing PC type programming and you've got virtual failures, is to apply that text that's returned by the fixture to the failure. So the control surface is labeled in accordance with what's coming back from the device, and you can differentiate between the original and after failure, which is the RPD, or whatever it might be. So I certainly found that as my top priority for implementation of how to expose brain loss. Okay. And actually, do you have a question? Okay. And actually, picking up on what Peter said, Scott, if you could go ahead and take <clears throat> talk sure. about the slot description. Sure. So, so the slot description, there's, there's several different ways we have of describing the, the basic functions of a slot in, um, uh, in DMX for, for a device. So slot description is really the first of the three three tools that we have here. Um, what slot description does is it gives you a just a simple text string for what the function is. Um, so in the uh, in the slot description message that you can see here, this is the response that you would uh, get back from the fixture. It tells you uh, the slot number I requested. So I basically go through if I have a footprint of 30 30 slots that the, uh, the moving light uses then I send a, uh, basically send 30 requests asking what the function of each slot is. And it will send me back um, uh, a message here, as you can see on the screen. It'll tell me, the first thing it'll tell me is the slot number I requested. So if I requested, you know, slot number five, and that is uh, intensity, 
then um, the, the text field here, you basically have 32 characters to describe to describe what it is. So it could be intensity or hand fill, uh, you know, uh, color mixing, um, the, the color control channel, gobo control channel, rotating gobo. Um, and so basically it gives you all of those. So if I have um, uh, a moving line with pan and tilt, obviously, my first first slot is probably going to be pan high. The second slot will be pan coarse. Um, you know, relating to a 16-bit uh, and build channel. All right. So. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I just saw the screen change. So, so the um, spot number uh, in there runs from basically zero up to the, the footprint minus one. So if I have a device that says it takes three channels um, for you know color mixing LED fixture, then my slot numbers will be zero, one, and two. I mean, and this, that, is, this is important. It is relative to the fixture's footprint. It yeah. is not the slot number that it is patched to. So this data does not change as you repatch the fixture. Correct. So if my fixture is, it doesn't matter if my fixture is patched to DMX starting address of one or DMX starting address of 150. Um, this is if, it's, if it takes three slots, then this is going to be from zero to two for, the, for that range. Um, the second bit of information here is uh, if if I ask for a slot number that's outside of the range, then I'll get a NAC. A uh, NAC is basically means it's, it's something that the, uh, the device doesn't understand. So if I send a request for something that's out of range, um, if I ask if it takes three slots and I ask for slot 10, then I can expect that the device to send back a NAC with a, a, um, a reason code of data out of range. And this is typically used when the, the slot, um, when the footprint is not used or not defined, or if it's, as I said, if it's a number, slot number is requested as outside of the footprint size of that device. Um, also, the text for each slot can change with the DMX personality and language setting, which I think Peter was, was alluding to earlier. Um, depending on what mode it's in um, and what personality you're in, um, the functions of the, of the slots can change. So therefore, it's important that the slot descriptions match uh, the function for the personality that it's in. Um, if, I, if I have a fixture that has um, one mode, one personality, um, just has 8-bit pan and tilt, for example, and the next personality has 16-bit pan and tilt, then um, I'm going to have you know, two of the channels are going to be describing pan when I'm in the high resolution mode. And when I'm in the low resolution mode, only one of the channels should be described. Uh, yes, Peter. So this picking up on the second last parallel here, that has implications for controls because if you switch the personality from the controller, you, you had previously acquired the slot descriptions for that current personality, you would need to do so because switching from personality one to personality two may be able to result in slot one having a different slot description. So you can't rely on the slot descriptions that you might have previously acquired when you were in personality. Correct. Controllers need to be aware of that. When you, uh, Correct. Any, anytime the personality changes, you really cannot make any assumptions about what the functions of the product are that you discovered before. Um, typically, personalities are used for you know, changing what the function of the slots are. So as Eric was saying earlier, you know, all the different control modes that a, uh, that a fixture might have uh, in terms of its footprint and the number of uh, slots consumes its footprint. Um, in other cases, some have developed products where literally you change the personality and the, the function of the product is a completely different beast. So you can turn the thing from an apple to an orange by changing the personality. Um, it, actually, that's still in the fruit family. In some cases, you can change from an apple to a cow, depending on changing the personality. So, really, once you change the personality, any information you have, especially slot description type information, is um, stuff you're going to have to query. The controller will need to query again. Um, going back into the uh, the rest of the fields here, um, one thing that's important to note is the uh, the text string uh, is length terminated um, or um, it's either length terminated or null terminated. Actually, no, on this one we are only length terminated. Right? It, 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 as, as with all of RDM, strings are defined by their length. But if you encounter a null, you should terminate it. 
Correct. So to avoid confusion, the demo recommendation is use the length termination. There are some places where it is always the length, but typically most fields, including this one in RDM, it can be length or null terminated. And that recommendation is because of the possibility of UTF-8 in the future to just make sure you know, that it's handled by length and that you're not trying to parse what could be part of the Unicode. Correct. Well, one final one is when we get back to the distribution of personalities. The one thing a controller could reasonably choose is, in my opinion, if when you're in personality one, the slot description is slot one is red, and in personality two, the slot description is slot one is and you switch back to personality one, having been there previously and having known what the slot description for slot one was, it shall have changed. In other words, personality one the descriptions are static. They don't dynamically change from one moment to the next. Is that it, correct it, interpretation? It's, it's not called out in the standard, but it is, is heavily implied. You know, something like a software-defined media server could could violate that. But you would most likely be rediscovering at that point and, and sort of starting over from first principles. The standard does not currently support a means of dynamically changing the description of the slot. In other words, a controller can't write the first slot description down. Correct. Get the controller response. They're, they're expected to be defined by the manufacturer of the device. So it's currently an expectation that you would read all of the slot descriptions of all of your personalities at sort of start up. Device, you can assume that those are the personalities, the descriptions to use subsequently within the Which does bring up one of the, let's call it, quirks of the standard, is that you can only get slot descriptions for the personality that is currently active. If you want to get information about the slots for another personality, you actually have to change to that personality. Most of the time, this is stuff you do during show setup, so that's not a problem. But if you needed to do that live during the show, it does have the potential to change your, your output on stage. But the important part of that is that you can get a, the description of a personality without making that personality active. Yes. So you've got a, you've got a, got a good idea of what you're selecting before you yeah. go about yes. changing yes. that. So if there's a personality called stop output or going auto flash mode, yeah. that may that the hint is not to switch that to retain the salt descriptions. And changing personality of a device during showtime is probably a bad idea. I'm going to say 90% of the time, you're going to get it, it's going to be doing something you do not want it to be doing. Yep. Given the fact it changes the definition of all the uh, slots. Okay. So, so slot. We talked about that there are three PIDs used to kind of define how the the the, the data is used. Another question here. Yeah. Just real quick on that, that subject. So in the case, I may be completely off base, but in the case you have a, a show and you've got, let's say, 10 pictures on a ring, and one of those pictures, either before the show, during the show, or after the show, gets swapped out by somebody that doesn't know what they're doing. Yeah. And instead of putting it in the right right slot mode or, the, or personality Perfect. mode, yeah. they put it in a completely different. So unless the controller goes and pulls exactly what's out of the network, there's no automatic response that the the, the controller is going to know. Wait a minute! I had ten pictures that were all the same personality. Now I've got one that's completely different. So it will but, know um, if it's if it's doing background discovery and, and you know discovering a monster just walks in the rig. Not necessarily pulling all the parameters for everything, but it would see when I sw when you swapped out that picture, it would see the old picture went away and a new picture showed up because the UID in the picture would be different. The electronic serial number if you would would be mm -hmm. different. So at that point, the controller wouldn't know anything about that particular device. So depending on how the controller is built, it would probably go out and query a lot of the basic functions. Aut automatically. Yes. And you would get either this original hint of the personality from the device interface. Because one of the summaries, like one of the first things you're likely to do in the responder after having established the basic communications and the discovery is a get device interface. That's a nice contrast. And certainly there are some of the management equipment out there, like the menu management software, does recognize that, hey, you know, 
I've got a list of all your fixtures up. This one is grayed out because it's not responding. And then, hey, there's this new thing here. And then it's a pretty simple matter. It's basically the way you know, basically say, hey, I replaced that, you know, right click, reassign, and put it to this one. I'm not aware of any current tool that then actually go out and automatically configure it for you to be in the same mode, but that is technically possible. We, we have a, a package that doesn't do it automatically, but I, I'll offer you a this. This is, this is what you had yesterday. This is what I've currently found. Would you like me to replace uh, X with Y? In which case, it will attempt to update the fixture you just found that wasn't there yesterday to the one that it hasn't found. There's, there's risk in automatically just replacing because you don't know that the replacement was one for one. Yeah. They, there may have been a situation where they moved Luminaires around because of convenience yeah. so that hey, when we get that one, it's on the end of trust. And so you can't get it. It would be the one that's missing may not even be where it was originally. Uh, complete automation doesn't make a great deal of sense, but certainly often it uses. The fact that things have changed, and would you like to try and match them as best as possible? Work, work through the manual, which is still a very powerful tool. Okay. I did have a thought on the you're changing a personality during the show, and you're changing from a personality that's, say, three slots to one that's four slots, and you already have somebody that's using that four slot, you have to remap the whole. Yeah, no, you're, you're not going to want to do that. Yeah, so that's all it comes to a couple of times. Yeah, I would think you never want to do it. Yeah, five minutes before the show started, someone from the fish started with the rig that was in the first night before. We had five slots. He's now you know, living every time the next feature of the rig is reducing the people who were supposed to do it. So there you would rush in and change your back to the required personality. Okay. Generally speaking, outside of a uh, a specific emergency that you know exactly what you're doing. If you're changing personality on a fixture during the middle of the show, you're doing it wrong. <clears throat> Should have several more. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Are you really sure you want to do that? Okay. So we've talked about that this is that there are the three pins that you can describe. And this is the first one. Slot description. It's very simple. You ask for, I want the description for this slot within the footprint and it gives you a human readable string. Now, the next PID, the second PID, is the fault slot value. Here we have a view of what the actual payload looks like on the wire. Milton, you want to talk about this one? Yeah, the, big, the thing that's uh, interesting here is it's a typical RDM PID, same format and so forth, but the data that is uh, coming back here is the default slot value, the name of the PID. So we have the slot, uh, the, the slot offset, i.e., which slot in the footprint Again, of this relative device, to the relative device. to the address of the device. The the data is a listing of each slot and the 8-bit value that would be associated with its default. Now, again, this is a an optional PID. You don't have to do this. So let's go back to the old days of dimmers. What's the default value? Typically going to be zero, where uh, whatever, you know, when you are not receiving DMX or when the thing, the dimmer turns on, it'll default to a level of zero. Uh, but as we get, in, get into things like automated fixtures, it starts making sense to declare what our default value is. And notice that it is an 8 bit value here. We'll get into that in the next slide in a moment or two. But, uh, it, we, we've got all of the, we can define a default value for all of the slots. Now, keeping that in mind, if we can go on to the next slide, note the default isn't typically defined. Okay, typically zero intensity, open white beam, 50 50 position for X and Y axis on moving lights and such. Notice that within this PID, it is possible to skip slots within the footprint. And that's something we didn't really say a little earlier. But for any given personality, there is a footprint. And the footprint absolutely must be a contiguous group of slots. A given device, fixture, whatever it is, may not occupy, for example, slot zero 
and slot 1 and slot 5. It must occupy a, a contiguous group of slots. So, but within this slot, uh, default slot value PID, you are allowed to skip around and define the slot default values. And we don't see this as nearly as much as we used to. In, shall we say, the bad old days, there were a lot of fixtures that were developed with proprietary protocols that were moved over to DMX that would have fields that didn't apply but were still left within the footprint. I'm thinking of checksum yeah. in a lot of the early lightwave products mm -hmm. that it was declared as part of the footprint but didn't do a darn thing. Yep. We don't see that as much anymore, but the standard does support gaps within <clears throat> the usage. But one of the other things that it's worth noting here is um, on some of these, some of these uh, PIDs that are going to be um, on a complex device are going to be more painful to implement than others. Um, if I've got a media server with hundreds of channels, then the, the, the slot description uh, is a little tedious unless I, you know, organize my code in such a way I can pull all the uh, information out of a table. Um, but one of the more important PIDs here that is useful to do, even if you have a complex device, um, is the default slot value. Because it really helps the control. If the controller doesn't have a library for the uh, for the media server for the for the fixture, um, you you typically have to have the more channels, the more complex the device. You have to have a lot of channels in a very specific setting, very specific values, if you want to get any output at all. And so the the purpose of the default slot value is basically for the console to know where all the channels should normally be. So the only thing you have to do to get output then is just bring up the intensity, bring up the dimmer, and you'll actually have output, and then you can start modifying things from there. Um, so the, what default is means is not defined. It should just be something sensible for the fixture. If, as I say here, it might be zero intensity, open white beam, 50-50 position. It's probably not strobing green with a rotating leaf go ball. You know, imagine a situation where somebody is in a, and they're trying to figure out what this slot does, and they're just trying to probe the fixture themselves. You just want this to be at something, so for example, if you move intensity, you'll see intensity, you know, you'll see something come up. Now, another thing I want to call out here, many fixtures have control channels, strike lamp, reset, rehome motors, things like that. You want your default slot value to represent an idle control channel, in other words, the control, the control channel not doing anything not putting it in reset, not, you know, rehoming it. Because a lot of people say, well, I need to, we jokingly used to call it the magic channel dance, but I need to know the magic channel dance to make my fixture rehome or reset or strike lamp. In the world of RDM, we get rid of the magic channel dance. You use RDM to strike the lamp. There's standardized ways within RDM to say strike lamp or reset fixture or soft reset or hard reset. So a fixture that implements this should be able, if it is well implemented RDM, should be able to leave the control channel APA control slot at no action, you know, at, at do nothing for the entire time. What you definitely should not do is in your default slot values, put it to something active like strike. So also worth noting is in default slot value, this PID is a get PID only. Uh, you may not, from a console, set the default values in a, in a device to something other than what it's being, what you're being given. This is information that's coming from the device. Uh, it is not something that gives you uh, more more levers to pull. Uh, you can only get the information and apply it to yourself. You can't change the characteristics of the device you're talking to. Now, when you get into larger devices, particularly uh, moving lights and various things that have a lot of slots of information, it's, uh, you can exceed the number of bytes that can be contained in an RDM packet. So if you do have a whole lot of bytes trying to come back describing the default slot values, you might have an ACK overflow uh, sequence of events. So you know, if you run the math out, how many uh, how many bytes can come back in an RDM packet 256? Then 
break it down, you can you find that you can send back up to 77 slots of uh, default slot values. Also worth noting is that I pointed out earlier, the slot offset is a 16-bit value. It's the, uh, you know, the, the slot number. But notice that the data, what is the default value, is only an 8-bit value. So what has to come back, for example, in a 16-bit mode device, for example, TAN is a 16-bit value, you would have to, def uh, default slot value would be given for two slots that together represent that TAN, 16-bit uh, TAN value. So one thing I do want to clarify on the ACK overflow. So an RD, the payload within an RDM packet can be up to 231 bytes, which does allow 77 slot values to be declared. However, there is no requirement that RDM responders fill out the maximum payload size. So they could, even a, a responder that is smaller, that has the that has a footprint of fewer than 77 slots, can still use ACK overflow sequence. So controller manufacturers should not assume that, should not assume that they will not double negative there, should not assume that they will not get an ACK overflow even if it has a smaller footprint. You should be prepared to get ACK when you're doing these PIDs that are packed arrays of structures. You should be prepared to get an ACK overflow and to reassemble that ACK overflow sequence to get all of the data that you need. You could be getting an ACK overflow but there shouldn't be the And it's an easy thing to miss but it can sneak up on you when you're doing it. And this might be the first time you do that with the other Yep. And we just bring it in here, showing that it's one of the tools that might come into play down at the bits and bytes level of things. And you know, lastly, as we've been saying all along with, um, with other things, these default slot values should change with the different DMX personalities. Uh, most likely they will. So, mm -hmm. Like everything else, the, the, the device completely changes what it is and how it works. So if a personality, a new personality is being selected, not only should the personality be selected, but also the, the uh, definitions or the default values and the uh, description of the, of the slot should be reattained under that new personality. Great. All right, so before we go on, I do want to stop and ask for questions because we're going to get into some of the more confusing parts of this show. Bob, you have a question in the room? Well, I have a comment. I mean, the, a bad use for personality <laughs> is to define the processor board from product A to use it in product B. To have it, to basically have the premise that you can turn your apple into a cow, you should not. Be, if your hardware cannot change from an apple to a cow, don't use a personality because after all, you will stick. You're going to take this PC board, stick it into that product, and, and then change its personality. The personalities, I would say, sanely should be able to be useful in the electronics package that it is mounted. Correct. You should, your, your responder should not declare things that it cannot do. If you have a, for example, if you have a slot that is named, you know, rotating indexing gobo, you probably ought to have a rotating indexing gobo in that system. If you need to say undefined or not supported or simply not declare it, as we talked about, you can have gaps because you are reusing the same electronics or the same software across fixtures that is perfectly acceptable. But to avoid user confusion, if you declare it, you should support it. You know, don't 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 say that you know this. Don't say that you know. Don't declare three personalities. You know, one you know mixable white and one RGB, and then declare both of them on fixtures that you know. If you have one fixture that's all white array and one that is an RGB array, don't don't make it declare the white only functions. Believe it or not, that has been done. Really noted. I'm sorry? Really noted. Yeah. 
questions do we have? And if, Rick, I see you're attending remotely. If, if you do have a question, underneath the list of attendees, there's a raise hand icon, and we can give you access to the, the microphone. All right. Hearing nothing, we've now presented the two PIDs that are pretty straightforward. We've done slot description, and we've done default slot value. The third PID can get a little bit more complicated. Slot info. Slot info provides a machine readable data structure that allows you to characterize the relationships among the slots within the footprint. So far, we've just had a, a value, an 8 bit value that goes in that slot, and we've had a name for that slot. But this allows you to group slots together and say that, hey, this chunk of seven slots is all related to the same function, the same thing, the same activity within that fixture. And if you look here, it has a repeating block, let's call it a sub-data structure. So that sub-data structure is a five-byte substructure, and there is one of these five-byte substructures for each slot in the footprint. There there can be gaps like we've discussed before, although there typically are not gaps. And this is be partly because of how it's written and partly because we're, we're using the same data structure in two different things. This structure has two completely different interpretations depending on one value within it. You always have a 16-bit slot value, the slot offset within the footprint. But then the second field here, the slot type, defines whether this is a primary or a secondary slot. And how you interpret the rest of this substructure depends on whether this is declared as a primary or a secondary substructure. And that's why people get confused. So I'm actually going to go through. Scott, do you want to take this or should I? Uh, I'm, I'm fine taking it. Okay. So if it's a primary slot. So if, if it's a primary slot, um, you'll see that the slot type will be set to ST underscore primary the value of zero. Um, and then the slot label ID um, is basically there's a list of defined slot ID types that are in the standard and also on, on the web. So we see them here. And so these are for the primary slot IDs. So these are things like intensity, pan, fill, um, color wheel, the color mixing channels, uh, adobo wheel, frost, strobe, zoom. So these are basically like the primary functions that you would uh, that you would see in a, in a movie like. This is uh, a primary thing, and the thing it is, you know, slot number, off, you know, slot offset block is a primary slot, and it controls this list that you see right here. Correct. The second interpretation. So the second interpretation is, is if we have the slot type as a secondary slot, and you can see a list of secondary slot types here, which are um, things such as fine, timing, speed, control, index, rotation, index rotate. Um, if it is one of those, it's basically it's a modifier. So this secondary slot is a modifier to the primary in some way. So in the case of fine, this is basically for a 16-bit pan or tilt or 16-bit color mixing, if I use um, a, a secondary slot type of fine here, then this is telling, telling the controller that this is the lower eight bits, the fine control for pan or the fine control for tilt, whereas the coarse, pan coarse or tilt coarse would have been the primary slot. This is the fine slot, so this is the second byte of the 16-bit value. And then in the slot label ID at the bottom, there, you actually put the slot number that you're referencing, the, the 
this, this is the secondary four. So if um, case of pan and fill, um, let's say my tilt is at, I've got 16 bit pan and fill, so my tilt is at offset two um, for, for tilt force, tilt fine would that would be um, slot three. So in here for tilt fine, I would point it to slot two we have in the primary. We have examples of this that we'll show. Um, some of the other secondary slots types here are um, timing. So if it's a speed channel, if it's basically um, like M speed that controls the speed that um, hand and tilt may move or that a function may happen at, um, then that would be a, a timing secondary slot type. Um, and actually we have two, we have timing and speed because they are a bit different. In some fixtures, it might actually relate to a specific time depending on the value of that channel. In others, it could be a speed. Um, we also hear a uh, very important one you'll see is control. So if I have things like a gobo wheel and I've got a control channel or a function channel for that gobo wheel that lets me select whether the wheel is spinning or um, whether it's rotating, whether it's you know, doing a shake, um, those would all be um, things that are in the control channel. So that would be the secondary for the wheel. That it, let's, 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 we've got we'll examples of all of them. Yeah, those. We'll, we'll go through the physical examples. We do, um, we do have a question here in the room. Yeah. We talked the first field is slot offset in Grasp that. Yeah. The last field is the slot number. Now, is that the number? That's not an offset. It is an offset. It's an offset. Is it the offset that you relate to rather than the, the primary? So, the first slot, which has an offset of zero. Yes. So, you really need the slot. We've got an example that'll show this. Slot number is still the slot offset. Correct. It is, yeah, it is that. Yeah, so you can say the slot offset that this slot is secondary to. So the key, the key thing here is that this relatively simple data structure has two interpretations. The first two bytes are always the same, tells you whether it's primary or secondary, and then there's two interpretations here. We have some, some simple examples of this. And Milton, if you can take this, we're going to do the most basic fixture out there. Being a simple guy, I'm glad to take that on. So, so this is the example of uh, about the simplest bit of slot info you can have, a simple RGB LED fixture. So it uses three slots of information. Each of those slots, of course, is an 8-bit value. So we've got slot 0, the first address uh, slot for this fixture. It said it has been declared as a primary, so the interpretation we use for the 16-bit value that follows is what is this thing? It's the primary additive red slot of information. The end. That's all there is. Then we repeat that two more times. Uh, slot one is a primary to the, for the green, and slot two is the primary uh, slot for the blue. So that describes this fixture in its entirety. In 15 bytes, you've described the entire fixture. Woohoo! All right, so let's get a little more complicated. So we take that same fixture and say, you know, that was a good fixture, but now let's do it in 16 bit control. So now we're going to have a fixture that occupies six slots of data instead of three. Two bytes for each 16 bit value of each, for each color. So look at the first one, slot zero, that's the primary. Move back, Oops, back one, please. Oh, how did I do that? Ah, it's easy. Ah, cool. So, slot zero is the uh, primary for additive red. We might think of that as the course channel or slot. And so we, we got that. That looks just like the, uh, the prior, the 8-bit version. But then we look at the next entry of slot one, and we've declared that as a secondary slot. Secondary to what? It's the secondary slot, the secondary control to slot zero. So that's the alternate definition of that, uh, of that last data field. Then we just repeat this two more times. Slot two is the primary for red. Slot three is the secondary for red, or secondary to slot two. Slot four, uh, and there's a typo in there that should have been. Uh, Where's my typo? Um, these should have been red, green, and blue instead of oh, red, yeah. red. But, Sorry. you know, <laughs> no worries. All right, I'll fix that. So slot two would, be, would actually be primary green, and slot four would be primary blue. 
But uh, that that's sort of the next level up of all this. Uh, okay. Fifteen so are control of the same thing, and Bob had a question. Yet. Must the secondary be contiguous to the primary? Nope. No, it does mm. not need to be contiguous. Therefore, yeah. therefore, your slot secondary could your your slot secondary could be on offset six, referring back to offset zero. They it can, could, and they can back reference and forward reference. You yeah. can have a secondary that is declared earlier in the footprint and references a primary that is later on. In fact, I normally do that in most of the uh, pictures I've worked on in the past. The function channels come before the, uh, the, the, the primary channel, so I typically would end up having a secondary described before, before I have the primary. So a color function is normally in the, in the DMX uh, footprint and uh, personality. Color control comes before um, color mixing. So the color mixing would be the secondary, and then the color mixing would be the primary, but the color control would be the uh, color function would be the secondary. I crashed one console doing that the first time we saw it. So this is a pretty uh, pretty straightforward 16-bit fixture, but it can get a little more complicated. All right, so let me take this next one here. Here's an example of a moving head. <clears throat> so we start out with pan <coughs> at offset zero. There is a spine for a 16-bit pan that this secondary refers back to slot zero. So these two create a 16-bit pan. We repeat that. Slot two is the primary for tilt with a secondary fine that is secondary to slot two. <clears throat> but we have then there's also a secondary speed that is also a secondary to slot two. This is your motor speed parameter. So your tilt has both a fine and a speed. Now, here we come to one of the limits. Motor speed typically affects both pan and tilt. Notice how you cannot declare motor speed as linked to both. Correct. So what I'm going to do in that case is I will link it to the first primary. Um, there's no requirement of, of what you link it to, but I tend to always link it to whatever the first primary is that was to be associated with which is exactly what I did not do here. So oh, what Scott is saying, go. this secondary to slot two would actually be changed to the secondary um, to slot zero. So just move it. It does not. It does right. not. I have heard some people say that they interpreted this as that I could actually declare this secondary twice, that I could say that slot four is a secondary speed to slot zero and slot four is a secondary speed to slot two. I, it does not permit it, it does not allow it. It does not permit it, it does not disallow it. I am not aware of that being done in the field. No, I'm not. And I'm not I suspect done. many parsers would have a problem with it. But it is possible. So we have our pan, we have our tilt with motor speed. We have intensity, which in this case is a simple 8-bit slot. And then we get into the rotating gobo wheel, which has a control slot that is secondary to 6 and an index rotate slot that is secondary to six. But you can also say that your indexing rotating, that your index rotate here is a secondary to seven Correct. legitimately. Yep. So there is some ambiguity in this parsing. And I've, I've used that actually in other products I've done before where it, uh, it does work like that. So, slot info, it can get complicated. And this is only the brief variant. So Scott, I have just for you the entire file. <laughs> so we only here, got five minutes here, guys. <laughs> here is uh, here's actually a dump out of uh, some of my source code. So this is basically in the middle of me building the packet, the response packet, um, back to a request for this information. Is there a specific area you'd like us to look at here? Um, let's go through here and see. Um, I think let me do the color mixing first. Uh, and we'll figure out what page that is. And high. Yeah. Color function, okay. So the color function, if you scroll down, if you're on your you're, you're, you're fine there, I just scroll down mine. So here you can see I've got color function. Um, you'll see that it is the, uh, I've got set to control there. I like that. And if people are viewing remotely, you may have to scroll down your window. You should see a scroll bar on the side that will allow you to see this entire thing. So page. you can see um, by looking at the second byte there that the um, slot offset color function 
this is the fourth slot in my fixture, uh, fourth, fourth slot offset. Um, it is set to secondary control and it points to cyan as a slot dependency in slot five. And then slot five comes later. So this is another case where the secondary can come before the primary in the order that they are listed, as I said previously. So then I have um, cyan, magenta, and yellow for a color mixing fixture. And you can see each of cyan, uh, um, cyan, magenta, and yellow are um, uh, defined as primaries. Actually, is it uh, primary? Yeah, sorry, I was looking at something else here. I almost forgot what I did. Um, so as, as we were saying before, this, this, it gets complicated. Uh, being one of the primary authors of the standard, the first time I actually sat down with this particular section of the document and tried to go to it, it took me a few hours just to wrap my own head around what we'd actually said and how it actually worked. So um, it, it is confusing and complicated even for the best of us. Uh, but this hopefully gives you some ideas of how how things work. I think um, rotating gobo wheel is uh, the other good one to look at here. Um, and I think we can make this this file available on, yeah. for example, the RDM protocol or .org website. There's, there's we're, nothing all, we're, 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 we're running up against. Yeah, so, so I scroll to the end of the Yeah, That's right. Well, we'll right. Just, so the point is that these can get a little complicated, and it's not always 100% clear what you should do. A few notes about slot info, just like we talked about with default slot value, it can require an app overflow sequence, typically beyond 46 slots, right? a responder with a 46 slot footprint, but it can happen before then. And some of the defined lists here, like what we showed you earlier, like this one, we wanted to be able to expand these without having to rewrite the document. So check the, the ESTA website under the Control Protocols Working Group. There are some additional definitions for these fields that were added after the document was published, and you should include But There's also a link there. If you're working on a fixture and you, you don't see, um, you've got a, a, a function in your fixture that you don't see listed and would like to have it added, um, there's the, we, we basically created an escape clause in the standard for us that allows us to add these pretty quickly. So there's a contact um, uh, link on there so you can request new slot um, IDs to be added, new, new slot types to be added, and then um, those basically come to the task group and typically within a day or two we will um, we can basically approve those. Typically we might want to make it, if you, if you request something that's very specific, it's only applicable to your product, then, um, and it's not going to be you know, widely applicable, then um, we might want to try to massage a little bit to make it a little more general purpose. Uh, but generally speaking, we can turn those around and approve them and get, get IDs issued for them within a day or two, um, instead of having to wait you know, years for us to uh, make revisions to the document. Another important thing worth noting is, um, We've, we've got a lot of stuff in there for a lot of common, um, common, common genres of genres of products that you'll see, like moving lights and dimmers and relay control and smoke machines and all of that. But um, you know, if you're, if you're trying to do a media server, um, honestly, I would not even begin to try to describe I mean, the functions of a media server in here because it's going to be so complex. You have to have the values and um, all of the functions within a given slot. Um, are so specific. There's so many, so many options that you really can't do justice without having a um, a proper library built for that media server. So there's really no no point in my opinion, at least, of trying to describe a media server um, and the complexity of that um, with, with the the tools that are currently available here, um, unless you just really uh, really want to torture yourself. So I'm going to see if there are questions around the room about the slot info. Yeah, Bob. Um, I'm presuming when you were saying secondary slots cannot be reused in, or assigned to more than one object, we mean that slot offset X shall be the secondary Correct. for Y only, but X, but uh, Z can be the secondary for A. That is correct. So you can have multiple speed secondaries. Correct. And multiple rotating secondaries, but we're not trying to assign the same slot to two different other main functions. Yeah, for example, in the, in the color mixing example I showed where I had the color, the color function channel, um, the color function 
um, applies to cyan, magenta, and yellow, but I can only point it to one, so I, I point it to cyan. Uh, but it's, it applies to magenta and yellow as well. And intensity is the same thing. Sure. All right. So, other questions? Oh, okay. yes. So just to confirm again, so the maximum number of secondary slot inputs you can associate to a primary slot is two. You can associate any number of secondaries to a primary. But each secondary can only be associated to one primary. Okay, so you so, have, if you have a primary that's got four secondaries, yeah. as long as it points to that same primary. Yeah. And right. you can even have secondaries to secondaries. For example, if you had a 24-bit parameter, you would have a your primary, which would have a secondary fine, and then a secondary fine would have a secondary fine. Okay. So, but yes, yeah, so and I let me, let me repeat that because it is a little bit confusing. Each primary can have any number of secondaries associated with it, but a secondary can only reference one primary. Is that is that clear? Okay. And then the other question I had, which may be off topic here, but as far as the listed um, uh, functions that are not on the yeah on the screen, just off the top of your head, do we have something in there for animation wheel, and do we have something in there for a laser? I don't know about laser. Animation wheel, I think, is in there. Um, I don't know about laser. Uh, but again, so those are ones that you can go on the, on the website to the current definitions if they're not in there, if they're not you know, in the document and not on the table of updated definitions that have been added, additional ones, then you could simply request it and then we would be able to create those. And would requesting it be the only method to implement something like that? Or there that are not manufacturer specific. Right. Okay. Because so they there, need to be basically described in a way that, that the machine can have to consist of. Um, for the controller, uh, we don't have manufacturer specific in this, in this area. There is an effects wheel that is defined, but not an animation wheel. So depending on how you define it, I mean, to me, an animation wheel and an effects wheel are relatively similar mm -hmm. um, because there is also a, um, a prism. But, you know, if you feel differently, you would have to request another one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, another question in the room here. Uh, I think it's worth pointing out because historically, with some of these, those are like the mm -hmm. uh, sort of uh, marketplace that uh, you're working in, slots were regarded as a relatively expensive thing. You only had so many slots, right? The next, you only had a small number of units. So the overloading of the slot, you know, the concept that you've got this slot and the values between one and two. So we must be doing all right. Thank you, sir. All right. Any other questions around the room? Yeah. Is there any space for the secondary label ID to be written for it as you guys open there? It couldn't say red course and red fine? You can, you, you can display things as what makes sense in your data model. Because, you know, some consoles model color coincident with intensity. 
because they're using HSI kind of, some consider them, you know, do you consider it a beam parameter? You, you can represent it what makes sense. You know, we're not prescriptive about the text. This is more to allow your console to do something useful, you know, the console you're developing to do something useful with the data than prescriptive about how you use it. Okay. And, and uh, slot description is the right place to put those those words that you want to use and present to well, as, as a as a responder, you put the, you put the word in slot description. Yeah. As a controller, you can use different you can data. Yeah. All right. So just some final thoughts. Milton, you want to sure. kind of close out here? I have to take this. Uh, so as it says here, some consoles do screen matching on the slot description text. Something that we might not necessarily want to have happen, but we're aware that this has been implemented in the field where the human readable slot description uh, gets used by a console. They try to might try to interpret that information and assign a slot to a, uh, an encoder wheel, for example. And it may or may not be exactly what you would want it to do, how you would want it to be controlled. So if you, if you get a strange call that your <clears throat> You know that some console is treating your color wheel as a beam parameter. This may be what's going on. So, so imprecise error prone, as it as it says here. So something just to be aware of. And um, another thing we've got can't describe individual ranges for the slots. This is what we were talking about a few moments ago about the uh, overloading, uh, where. You know, uh, what, while a uh, given slot is in a, between the one value and another, behavior is different and so forth. Or as, as it says here, something like color wheels, where a specific color is achieved by setting a slot to a specific value. That really isn't achievable through slot info. And also, in the future, we, we are looking into revising the standard and making so, so the slot info is perhaps more useful, more descriptive, and uh, using JSON to give us a better characterization, to give us a little more control and uh, granularity and versatility and how we get information back. Because uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing where slot info is not necessarily able to cover everything we'd like it to, and there might be future ways of doing that. Yeah, I think one, one important thing to say here about this is, is obviously the uh, so the main limitation of all of this is that we only talk about what the overall function of a you know, given channel or slot is here. We don't go into the details. So as Peter was talking about, you know, within, within a slot you might have a control channel, you have all different specific functions depending on what value it's set to. And that's something that we've never attempted to cover in all of this because complexity balloons very, very quickly. Um, so we've been we've been looking for years at, at different ways of how to more accurately you know represent all of that level of detail data, detail slot data. I and think if you want if you want details about that, get in touch with one yeah. of our task group members, and we'll tell you how to do that later. Yeah, we we welcome input from people who have experience with with kind of fixture data modeling and JSON. It's, it's a complicated problem. It's, it's not something we're currently working on. It is something we are hoping to tackle in the future. And it should be noted too, even uh, if and when that happens, all of the stuff we've talked about today does not go invalid. It will also be supported. Um, this will be in addition to. It will be in addition to. And if things support that, that's great. If you've got older devices uh, or current, de current new devices that support slot info, well, that's going to be there. That is part of your standard. It's not going away. So I'm going to um, actually, yeah, we have a question in the room here. No, you got to pick one of these, and I need to take the closure here. And this, this slide is, some, this is Eric, Eric Johnson speaking. This is some of my opinion. These are not universally agreed with. What should you do? What should I do? All three PIDs are relatively simple to implement. These are all predefined data for each personality. There's no runtime calculation, so this is not a lot of complexity. It's usually table lookups and just you know static data that you return when request. You should definitely implement slot description and default slot value if your responder has a non-zero footprint. If you use DMX data, I guess maybe not if you're a dimmer, a single parameter dimmer, but you implement slot description and default slot value. They're incredibly simple unless you are just absolutely dead out of flash memory, implement them. 
There's no trade-offs. Your user can at least get a human-readable name and a sensible set of default values. Those, I think, are generally pretty widely agreed upon. This last one is my opinion. Implement slot info only if it makes sense. If you find that you are having to jump through hoops and do secondaries to secondaries over and it's just not doing a good job of describing it, it's better to leave it out than to confuse the heck out of a control image. Sometimes you can do a partial description. You may be described your pan tilt intensity and your subtractive or additive color features, but not try and describe your indexing, indexing rotating, shaking go -go's or, or something like that. It's better to say nothing than to provide confusing data. Um, that opinion is not universally shared, but again, it's static data, but it's what the, what the receivers do with that data. So I'm going to close. I'm going to just go through the last thing here, and then we will open it up for questions at the end. I know we've run over. Hopefully you found it, it worth the time. What do, how do we get support? This is a technical protocol. There's a lot of questions. I point you to rdmprotocol.org, the forums. It's a high quality technical discussion forum. Extremely low volume of posts, one a month maybe. But because it is a moderated forum, your first post must be approved. Once we realizing, once we once we recognize that you're asking valid technical questions about RDM or or, or, or as the protocols and not trying to sell knockoff handbags, then you'll be able to post and participate immediately. So don't be surprised if your no, first no. post takes a little bit of time to show up. And by a little bit of time, like it's typically within a day. Um, as, as the administrator of it, basically I get all the spam. And uh, when I see somebody actually is registered and, and, and is posting a real question, then I go in and, and basically allow their account to post freely. So after that, you can post a will. And one important thing is, is while it is very low volume, um, whenever somebody does post, it sends notifications out to most of us that are on the task group. So, um, you know, we're not checking it every day, but when somebody posts, we get notifications and we go out and try to give real responses, you know, within, within the day or so. And it's a great resource if you have questions about sub-devices, about slot info. If you search for key terms, there's a great library of discussions dating back probably 10 years yeah. that may answer many of your questions. I think, people, I think people who use this find that it gives good, high-quality technical answers usually within a couple of days. Um, or hours. You may get multiple conflicting answers, but at least you'll have a good discussion of what's going on. Um, so please use this, use this, use this freely. Um, we really want this to be the go-to for technical discussion. So with that, that is the end of our, what we went over. What questions can we address? And yeah, what, what questions can we address for, for people? All right. Seeing nothing around the room? Well, thank you, everybody. We appreciate it. I am going to go ahead and terminate the recording as soon as I find the button to do it. Thanks, Rick.